Right now for the first time, money is a content type. It can, we have a choice, we can pick what type of money we want to use for the first time in history. We're not bound by jurisdictional limits or any sort of regulation or restrictions in terms of money that we use. I could easily now use Bitcoin all over the world, just the same as every single other person. That is a really scary for for the regulators because for the first time they don't have control over the money supply hello 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 and welcome welcome back to the bitstocks podcast we're coming at you with episode six live from the bitstocks london hq and today we have a special guest uh one of our very own team members from the bitstocks family how's it going guys how's it going i'm joined with our usual co-host Stephen arthur and our special guest for today is Ilya Yusuf. And Ilya is head of OTC and settlements. Uh, been at Bitstock since the early days. Yep, 2015. I mean, I'm part of furniture here, you could say. Yeah, unfortunately, I've known Ilya a lot longer than that. Uh, he goes way back to when we were kids. Um, we'll dive in shortly with an introduction to Ilya. But before we do, just the usual stuff, guys. Uh, please hit the likes, give us any feedback in the comments, and hit the subscribe button. Uh, hit the bell notification as well when you do. It will give you an alert on your phone or device when we upload a new episode. It's not just the podcast we're coming out with now. We also have the crypto time, which is you can send in your questions for the portfolio managers to answer. And uh, we've also got the vlogs. We've also got, got many other videos and content that comes outside outside of that as well. So just hit the notification bell and you'll get notified when content hits hits the screen. Uh, you'll be able to catch all of this on YouTube, iTunes, and Spotify. Uh, please do not consider any, any of this as investment, financial, tax, or any form of advice. We're just a few nerds just talking blockchain and everything crypto. And yeah, we'll dive in. Before we do introduce our guest, Stephen, yep. uh, I think we'll start with the usual one big bit of news, very high level summary from the past week, something that you've seen. Yeah, sure. So mine is all about Binance. Um, Binance are if not the largest exchange uh, in the crypto arena. They offer quite a few pairings um, and they are looking to take on quite a few more assets. Um, their main trading pairs are USDT, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and I think one or two others. Um, actually, I think it's just Bitcoin, Ethereum, and USDT. Now, recently they have launched Binance Uganda. The trading pairs are both ETH and Bitcoin connected to the Ugandan shilling. Now, they have yeah recently launched this within the past week they've had in excess of forty thousand signups which is massive um and that is a little bit about what i want to touch on today so they have announced in singapore when you and i were in singapore Ilya, uh, they announced that they will be looking to onboard between five and ten different fiat pairings um cz actually mentioned it was super easy for them to open bank accounts um in the jurisdictions they're looking at but they're just not going to go to south america now, one thing they've done is really smart, and you could look at this from an investment approach, is currently they haven't listed the BNB token. Now, there's a couple reasons why they haven't done so. In order to trade the BNB token, you would need to have a crypto. Um, and they've targeted Uganda pretty much because the economies and ruins, their, they, you know, their hyperinflation uh, monetary system is a shambles. And they currently don't have a lot of crypto. Now, Leaving that um, until the first month is over where there's zero trading fees will then enable people to migrate from these volumes to BNB token, which will then increase the demand for it. Um, and we could, one could argue that price would increase alongside with it because simply the velocity of mon money will increase. Um, but that is something really interesting and um, it's something we're looking into. Um, and we've actually spotted one or two fundamental flaws in their method. Um, can't say too much now because we're actually changing our exchange and um, tailor fitting it in order to achieve what Binance doesn't. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it there. That's my bit of news. Yeah, so just to wrap up on your point before I dive in, um, people are essentially tired of the financial control, the hyperinflation, and all the turmoil and issues that they've seen in the African market specifically. Um, again, I won't reveal too much. As I said in the previous episode, we are expanding our platform and ecosystem, coming out with new services and offerings uh, via a big launch. 
The official BitStocks announcement of our new platform will be announced at CoinGeek, which is in London on 28th of November. CEO Michael Hudson, uh, he'll be actually presenting the new platform and offering. But essentially, an element of that is that we will be targeting the African markets as well. So a lot of the issues that we have seen and what we are all passionate about solving will be doing going forward. So uh, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, we'll be coming out with that announcement uh, about our new platform and offering that we've been working away at for the last few months and you'll be able to find out more my big bit of news for the last week so you may have seen that coinbase announced uh support for the basic attention token now this is actually not a surprise to me at all because as previously touched on in july they released a blog post uh, where they said that they'll be they're looking at potentially listing zrx which has now been listed stellar zcash cardano and basic attention token now, uh, I had a feeling BAT would be next, but there was nothing to really give it away like there was for ZRX because with the ZRX, they had Coinbase board members and ex-Coinbase members on on their board, actually, sorry. So that's what kind of gave it away because there was a direct relationship and a hookup. They, they essentially had the plug, right? Um, in this case, uh, nothing really gave it away, but there was a lot of rumors boiling up. And essentially, when Coinbase announced it themselves a few months ago, it was bound to happen. Uh, people have got their eyes on the other three tokens now, potentially listing. Uh, now, you know, we're monitoring the price. And it did react somewhat like ZRX did, where they announce it on Coinbase Pro. There's an initial spike, and then it somewhat stabilizes and cools off. And when it goes on Coinbase itself, uh, so they start offering it to retail traders because Coinbase Pro is predominantly aimed at institutional. So when, when they offer it on Coinbase to retail, there's going to be another spike. Um, obviously, in a few days, we'll find out if I was right or not. Uh, hopefully, should be based on past performance of listings. And that's essentially what's going to happen. Um, now, Coinbase have said they're going to list up to 300 cryptocurrencies um, over the next, I don't know what the time span is, I believe it's the next couple of years, sort of medium term. Now, obviously, if, if they're going to list so many, future listings won't react how these previous listings have because the market was sort of mature and, and stabilized and it won't react as, as much as it has done. But yeah. Yeah, I, I agree with that point. Um, I think one thing that is important to note is with Coinbase, there are two tranches of launching. There's Coinbase Pro and Coinbase for retail investors. Now, whilst I do agree that the market will be diluted once they do sort of add these, you know, massive tranches of new listings, I also think that argument is pretty flawed in some sense because like we said, Coinbase Pro is more tailored towards the um, institutional investors. Now we can assume that these investors are the savvy ones within the market so they can spot great investments from a mile away just like what we do um, and therefore I don't think that it will dilute the market. I think it will dilute and weed out all the shit coins in essence but all the good coins will still see that volume and will still see it flourish. Yeah, I mean just to touch on both your um, points, I think Binance, so just to go on uh, Stephen's first point first, um, Binance, I think one thing we've seen in cryptocurrencies ever since the beginning is always this big push about remittance. You know, Bitcoin is meant to come in, is meant to completely change the remittance market, moving money overseas between Africa and, and the rest of the world, allowing people to move money and send money back home a lot more easier and take back that those fees where it was, in essence, I, I believe a few billion, which was taken from the poorest people in the world uh, in fees. Uh, it's good that, you know, we're a little bit late. I do think this should have been an adoption that happened a long time ago and a little bit earlier. But it's good to see that a company like Binance is seeing that. Um, I mean, with us, we've seen this and we've we've spoke about it many times, you know, in our meetings. And, you know, Africa has been a big focus for us. You know, allowing the unbanked to become banked is a very good um application for cryptocurrencies. And essentially it's one of the first and the very early ones which we saw Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies changing a traditional market, the remittance service. So I think it's very positive news for the market as a whole and the whole cryptocurrency community. Um, I do see various other exchanges following um, and launching, launching Africa-based services. We do know how big Africa is and the demand for cryptocurrencies is huge. I mean, they're already using the um, the M-Pesa, I believe it is out there, uh, yeah. in, in, in huge, Kenya. Huge in Kenya. Yeah, so that, that's just showing the demand for digital currency and digital money out there uh, is really big and huge. So Binance, I think they're going to be very successful out there, and I do see other people following. Um, and touching on the whole Coinbase Pro and Coinbase um, issuance, we've been monitoring 
um, Coinbase and what they've been doing with their listings for quite a while now. I mean, they got a lot of criticism for the way they launched Bitcoin Cash. Uh, I mean, there was all these allegations which came out in the very early days of the Bitcoin Cash, uh, market manipulation. We have seen, you know, the um, the SEC and various other regulators really worried about manipulation on these exchanges. Um, so it's interesting to see the way they've changed adding their listings now because essentially they released a blog post which they stated all the coins that they, they want to list. Um, what's going to be interesting to see is one, Zcash, a completely anonymous coin. Um, yep. What sort of regulatory fallbacks are they going to get by listing an anonymous coin? Um, we do know with the traditional markets, every, there's a requirement to understanding where the money has come from before. The, the trail which the traditional market really wants to see is where has this funds come from? Yeah. When you're loading your accounts, okay, has it come from a nefarious source? With an anonymous coin, it's a lot harder it's to prove hard that. It's hard to do your AML, Some, KYC. Exactly. Sometimes impossible, you know, for source of funds. So that's one that I think we're going to monitor very closely and to see how they do it. And also is going to be security tokens. Um, I mean, ZRX, I believe ZRX was a raise. They raised one or two million yep. in a very early mm -hmm. day. So it was an ICO. Um, that can be construed as a security token. Um, we're not sure if they've got the proper licensing yet to yeah. list security tokens. Is there going to be a fallback later on down the line where the regulators come and say, hey, guys, you've been trading security tokens since X, Y, Z. It's going to be very interesting. I do think this year has been very much in the regulatory space uh, where we have seen regulators really coming in and mm -hmm. really taking control of, of the market. I mean, going all the way back from January where we saw every regulator from different jurisdictions coming out almost simultaneously and releasing these bit of legislations about cryptocurrencies. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, sweet. Thanks for that. Um, and obviously just to touch back on the point you made about the Africa region. So myself and Stephen, we've actually done an in-depth analysis of the African market. And actually you'd be surprised. A lot of the infrastructure that's in the African market and region is a lot better than people thought. Um, apart from bar sort of a few of the central African uh, jurisdictions. Beyond that, majority of Africa has actually very, very impressive infrastructure and people have underestimated that. A lot of it is in place and people can penetrate those markets and are planning to do so as we are. Um, now, one of the things that me and you have seen are these sort of payment thresholds that are in place in a lot of the jurisdictions, which is essentially a cap that is in place whereby if, for example, you are in, let's say, Uganda and you're trying to send money to the UK or a foreign jurisdiction, there's an annual cap uh, per person in terms of the amount of fiat currency that you can send abroad. Now, uh, obviously, in some of these jurisdictions, that cap is very low. And naturally, a solution to that, a way around these uh, regulatory burdens is cryptocurrencies and payment services that will be offered exactly as a solution. That. Exactly. Um, that. So that's one thing we'll be offering. Um, again, a lot of the details will, will be coming out in the coming weeks. So, so please bear with us. Now, appreciate, obviously, we, we've touched on a lot of things and Ilya's dropped a lot of knowledge bombs already before we've actually even introduced him. So, yeah, let's dive in, mate. Um, as I said, unfortunately, I've known you for a long time. But for those listening or watching, give us a little brief of who you are, what do you do? Um, what's your story at BitStocks and, and your day-to-day, -day really? Yeah, so I mean, I first come across cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin, um, probably 2011, um, I'd say. A few people I called straight away uh, when I first discovered Bitcoin. Uh, Cyrus was one of them. Uh, a few people in the office were others. Uh, and the first thing I said was, we need to mine this. <laughs> I mean, um, I'm sure Sarah will tell you um, back home, if you walked into my room, it was completely covered with um, computer hardware. And the first thing I, I, I saw what Bitcoin was going to do. And I really did want to get into the whole mining scene and uh, eventually even purchasing coins myself. I mean, when I first come across Bitcoin, there was no exchange. There was, there was, there was no Mt. Gox. You know, one of the easiest ways to buy it was on Bitcoin Talk Forum. Um, so, so yeah, that, that was my early experience with Bitcoin. Um, I've been with BitStocks ever since 2015. Um, and ever since then, I don't think I've ever looked back. I do believe this industry is going to completely change the way we see modern forms of money, uh, just exactly the same way that internet has changed information. Um, 
what I do at Bitstock. So I head up the OTC desk uh, as well as the settlement part of things. So, I mean, we've experienced growth in our OTC desk uh, quite dramatically over the last few years. I mean, we've had clients, um, as Cyrus mentioned, even from Africa who are doing exactly the same thing that he's been speaking about. We've had them with us ever since, you know, 2015, 2016. So we, we're growing our book now and we're really doing a big push. As he said, uh, we're about to release some new features, some new aspects to our OTC desk, uh, which really we want to do just to take us to that uh, next level. Great. Amazing. Um, one of the things you said is you deem this space to flourish. Yeah. Now, I was recently at an SVK event. Great event. Them guys host amazing events like always. We've been supporters since Genesis of their firm, really, um, about this time last year. Um, and one of the comments where, um, you know, there were, there were two people there um, on the panel in specific, one of which was an investment associate at Virgin. He looks after Richard Branson's wealth and helps invest it accordingly. And another gentleman was called Stephen uh, Coho. Uh, Stephen Coho, I think that's correct. And he's from Galaxy. Now, one of the questions was, when will we see mainstream adoption and institutional money? Now, my personal thoughts are, we will see it, but not anytime soon. And I think where we'll see it would be different to cryptos. So for one, we've seen VC investment in the firm, um, in this space increase. That isn't going into cryptocurrencies. We've been monitoring that ourselves. It's going into um, equity-backed tokens. So actually buying equity in companies like ours that enable services for the space to grow. Now, one would then ask, when would firms start to invest? Now, firms invest accordingly to all of their internal quant analysis. Um, one of the tools is VAR, value at risk, which essentially just measures the downside of an asset, how much they could lose. Now, because cryptos are very, very volatile, um, this VAR is massive. Now, in my opinion, it's only when that VAR diminishes where volatility really is stabilized and where regulation can then come in to classify these assets as particular assets, the space will then flourish and accept this. What, what are your sort of thoughts on that? So, I mean, in terms of the institutional investors, what a lot of people don't realize right now is um, for institutions to really get involved, mm -hmm. there's certain services that we just right now lack, yeah. which are being built. I mean, one of them is custodianship. Um, when you're talking about an institution getting involved, what they really want to do is they don't want to worry about securing the asset. They essentially, traditionally, they have prime brokers and, and other custodians and depositories who do that part for them. We're still building this infrastructure. I mean, we've got um, BitPay, I believe, yep. are, are looking to do it. Um, we've got quite a few other service providers, even Coinbase themselves, are looking to do a custodian, custo program. Custo yeah. custodian service. I mean, there's quite a few things we need before we see real institutional funds come in. Um, also, the other part, I do believe we're still very much in an infant stage of the mm -hmm. market. I believe the total market cap, correct me if I'm wrong, guys, um, we're in 200 billion, 200, 200 billion yeah. 250 billion, roughly around there. I mean, we've seen it fluctuate for the last six months or so between that range. Yeah. I mean, if you have a big pension fund who are going to come in and put a percentage of their AUM, they manage trillions. I mean, that percent might seem small to them, but mm -hmm. it's going to going to completely change the, the space that we see it. Yeah. So we have to take that in mind that right now we are still building the infrastructures that we need for the institutions to get involved. We are seeing, especially on the OTC desk, a lot more hedge funds being involved, a lot more family offices. They're going to be the first movers because they're the ones who are a lot more mobile and a lot agile uh, in terms of their investment strategies. A lot of them have mandates where they just manage a certain pool of funds, their mandates allow them to, to move a lot more freely and actually invest and diversify in cryptocurrencies. So for the wider range of institutions, yeah, exactly what you said. A lot of the options that they have right now is to invest in, in the companies themselves because right now the tokens to do it securely isn't something which is ready for them. So they are looking at, right, what are the companies we're doing? Let's invest in Coinbase. We've seen Coinbase raise another round which valued them 300 at, million, Yeah, 300 million. Now they've valued at 8 billion. Um, we've seen yeah. Bitstamp be bought out in the last uh, few weeks. I mean, these are the same people who own Corbit mm -hmm. that who have bought Bitstamp. So we are seeing a lot more institutions being involved in terms of actually acquisitions. Um, 
So I do think we are a little while away from institutional money flowing into cryptocurrencies. But the fact that we're seeing it flowing into the companies, I believe is very, very good news. And it's actually very bullish for the whole ecosystem in general. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, one thing I want to touch on with the institutional money, actually, uh, me and Stephen are always going to events around in London or occasionally, you know, around the world where everyone from the industry gathers. And naturally, you've got more and more institutions pouring into these events, uh, more and more money, a lot of traditional financial firms, hedge funds, family offices, private investors, high net worth individuals. And a few of these events, actually, um, some people have been extremely su successful, some of the firms. They're asking myself and Stephen, obviously you touched earlier on the value at risk. Um, they're asking questions like, well, how do you apply the analysis? Because I did this, this and this. And they're essentially applying a lot of the old school metrics whereby you'd apply in the equities markets or whatnot. Yeah, uh, and I'm exactly. saying to them, uh, I'm saying to them, well, for example, one of them was, was asking me about the uh, modern portfolio theory. And I said to him, well, actually, as you've witnessed, we did analysis on this. I've run the modern portfolio theory on a selected basket of assets in the crypto industry and doing the sort of Markowitz efficient frontier, uh, the covariance of assets, the correlations, the standard deviations, which measure the risk, all of these stuff that you typically uh, sort of use as a, as a toolkit in the traditional markets. And it doesn't really apply in the crypto space as much as I've tried to uh, I wouldn't say force it, really looked at it from every angle. It's somewhat flawed. You can't apply these traditional methods in the modern, mar in the sort of crypto markets. Um, purely because uh, another thing we saw actually is the correlation matrix, a selected basket of assets that me and you picked. Yeah. Um, 2016, obviously naturally everything is between zero and one in this space correlation. There's nothing uh, going to negative one. So for those who are sort of, not may, might be getting confused in a nutshell you can you can google this uh, sort of modern portfolio theory but essentially a correlation of assets are between minus one to one and if it's uh, essentially one then they're very positively correlated like pretty much 100% uh, at zero, uh, they're not correlated at negative one, they're negatively correlated. So naturally in your basket, you'd like to have a few negatives uh, just to provide somewhat of a hedge and diversification yeah. method. In this market, you don't get that. In 2016, uh, you had a few assets that were sort of between the zero and three range, the rest were higher than, th uh, sorry, sorry, zero and 0 0.3, the rest were between 0 0.3 and one. In 2017, we saw more correlation. In this year, year to date, Pretty much, if you're looking at all of the assets in the matrix, they're predominantly red, indicating majority are heavily towards one. They're, they're all pretty much between 0 0.5 and 1. You'll find a few diamonds there, but uh, the fundamentals of those projects don't stack up. It's just historical performance year to date. So a lot of the stuff that, I, I mean, I could go on about this for days and obviously provide more context into it. And we will do in future episodes, um, we'll be covering a lot more stuff, but you just ca cannot apply a lot of the traditional analysis methods. And then they're saying to, to myself and Stephen, they're saying, okay, so how do I analyze an asset? And then we dive heavily into the, obviously the fundamentals, which we outlined to them. Um, some people in this space heavily geared towards technical analysis, which again, uh, we are not huge fans of. It's not something we completely ignore, but um, we're not huge fans of. Predominantly, a lot of it is fundamentals based, relationship based, news based, uh, what information you know, the relationships you build, the fundamentals, which we could go on to as well. We've outlined in previous episodes what factors those are. You can, we can outline maybe 30 or 40 yeah. fundamental I mean, aspects. The, but the big issue with uh, these traditional um, institutions which are coming into this space and looking at it and asking you these questions, I mean, we've seen it since probably 2013, 2012. Um, wow. These governments, like there's been a paper released um, by the NSA describing and discussing Bitcoin from 2013. There has been, you know, I've personally spoken to people who work at banks, high street banks, who are telling me they've got squads of divisions researching cryptocurrencies and blockchains since going back to 2013. So we know they're looking at this space. We know they've got actual research divisions and they're looking deep dive and going deep into the technology and, and the aspects of it but the issue is a lot of them yes they're starting to understand it a lot better now but the problem is this space moves very fast i mean we're probably a far cry from where we were in december where we saw the all-time highs we're a completely different industry right now money is morphing and evolving the cryptocurrencies are now changing everything we before we had this whole ico boom and you know 
everybody talking about ICOs and how great ICOs are. I agree, ICOs are great. The way it is that you can actually raise capital for your project or a company um, very freely and openly. I very do much advocate that in cryptocurrencies, but again, it has to be done correctly. Um, that's the issue that we saw with all of these ICOs where, you know, I believe some of the quotes were, majority of ICOs are run by two men and a dog. <laughs> so, I mean... <laughs> That's the issue and that's the image which we need to kind of step out of here, here here, in this industry. We need to provide proper infrastructures. When you're investing, let's just say STO is a great example. You know, you do need to provide a proper pack for these investors so they know exactly what they're getting involved in. And also equity in the actual project itself in the underlying company. So there's going to be a big change and I do think institutions need to actually look and ask people in this space which is really great that they're asking you guys because essentially we're the ones who are going to create the regulation in my opinion for the regulators and these institutions to follow we're going to be providing these guidelines and and these tools for everybody else to use so it's uh, it's really important that we yeah. do it right i think um i think it's good and i sort of want to address something um that not a lot of people like to talk about the whole sec now you you made a good point that we need we need regulation in order to make the the you know space flourish and i yeah. agree um the sec of i think last year they no to date actually from 2018 they have charged and stopped the ico of at least a dozen projects now yeah. with that comes issuing buybacks where they have to essentially buy back their tokens now this is a good thing because it's not only going to make people think twice before issuing a project two people and a dog for example they have to add utility and the SEC have released numerous statements saying, you know, providing a gateway as to what to look for. If someone is providing you an investment, you are entering an agreement with the thought of making profit. That is a security that will be classified as a security. So I think the space needs the SEC um, and it needs the FCA. It needs all of these bodies to come in collectively in order to sort of pave a healthy and secure gateway where people can get involved. Now, is it going to happen overnight? Probably not. Um, but you know, over time, this is what we sort of want to see. It's going to reduce volatility, almost like what the difficulty adjustment algorithm done to Bitcoin before, when we were seeing drastic changes, we could represent that with massive price spikes. Yeah. Um, I mean, just, just to add on that point, I completely agree with everything yeah. you said. I really do agree. We do need regulation, but to some extent, mm -hmm. um, the issue with regulation in this space and what they don't realize, in my opinion, what the regulators don't realize is they're now, we want them to work with us. Yep. We are giving them the opportunity to regulate us. Everybody in this space really does want the regulators to come out and put some sort of framework to allow us to operate in. It would make our life a lot easier. But what they need to understand is if they try to forcefully regulate this industry, it could kind of turn into something that they cannot regulate. And then something where we will not want their regulation. We will be self-regulating. That is what cryptocurrency allows a self-regulating movement. We've already seen this with uh, the UK Crypto Association, where a few companies in the UK, we've come together and we've we've forced, formed this organization, which we want to operate together while the FCA are sitting on the sidelines and saying, hey guys, seek your own independent legal advice. We've come together and we've bonded and tried to force regulation where we can all follow. This is going to happen when the regulators do two things. One, nothing or two force a regulation upon the whole industry they have to realize right now we're willing to work with them everybody wants the regulators to come on board and you know provide frameworks for all of us to to help use but what they need to realize is these frameworks need to they need to speak to companies like us and they need to realize and speak to 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 you two and to me and every other person in this industry and say right what regulations do we need to put in place let's work together and that is what I really do think needs to be done and what will really push cryptocurrencies for forward. Yeah, and a lot of that comes with education. So the points you gents have touched on with the regulation, what I touched on earlier regarding the analysis methods, uh, which currently traditional investors are using, a lot of this comes down to education of the industry, which, again, we can't emphasize again and again, we'll keep repeating this, just goes to show the infancy of the market. Um, people are impatient and those who are um, will not last long in this game. So off the topic of regulation, which you've touched on, uh, the very, very exciting, um, as, as you've seen, I was absolutely buzzing when this report came out. 
because I love regulation. Who doesn't? Um, last week, uh, Crypto Assets Task Force report was published. Yes. And a uh, nice detailed report. Um, essentially, they categorized crypto into three broad buckets. So the first was exchange tokens, such as your Bitcoins and your Litecoins. The other was security tokens, so tokenized form of traditional securities. And the third was utility tokens, so launched primarily for the purpose of raising funds, which do not have the characteristics of a traditional regulated product. Now, what's actually happened in this report, just a very uh, sort of summary, uh, what's come out of it is that uh, essentially at present, uh, the FCA has confirmed that utility tokens do not fall within their perimeter as well as utility, uh, sorry, exchange tokens and utility tokens do not fall within their perimeter. But it's a lot clearer around security tokens, which does fall within their perimeter, uh, which is actually very positive for those who are doing STOs. However, for those who are doing, uh, who sort of have their exchange tokens and going to be doing ICOs, uh, or for those who are utility tokens, it's a bit more of a blur. And they've announced that there's going to be a consultation in Q1 2019 uh, to essentially discuss a lot of the regulations around this. Now, most people would take this as sort of bearish news or negative news. But overall, the report was actually very positive. And they spoke about the importance of this space and this industry that will play in society. Um, overall, it seems like they want it to work. That's the way I, I took, I read the report anyway, what I took away from it. And they're just going to be a bit more firm in terms of the uh, money laundering. Uh, I believe it's called the fifth, fifth money laundering directive, which uh, they're going to basically get a bit more strict around the KYC and AML in this space. But otherwise, I think it was pretty positive news, especially if, you know, you are uh, you are going to be investing in a security token. The regulation is a lot clearer around those um, and essentially offering better protection for investors and the companies alike. Um, I don't know what, what you think about the UK space in particular, just to wrap up on that regulation topic. Yeah, I mean, so one thing which I find really interesting is it's been quite a while. We've been speaking to the FCA. Um, they've, you know, come to us quite a few times and we've gone to them and say, can we clear up certain things? And we've had the same response from them and it's, they've tried to keep their hands away and not really give us any answers. Um, so it's really good that the FCA are now coming out and making these statements. I mean, the fifth money laundering directive is something we've been following here at Bitstocks for ever since Genesis, since the company started, we've been doing AML and KYC as compliant as we can. Um, one thing we've tried to take here is to be as compliant as we can. We know what traditional institutions have to do and we want to follow that as much as we can uh, for what we do. So as well as the, I believe when they, when they categorize the three different assets, um, they said, right, so we're not really worried about exchange tokens, um, great utility tokens, but they really focused on security tokens. So what I do believe is we are going to see some sort of regulation, but it will be for these ICOs and for these security tokens, which seems to be on their radar. Um, when we're going to see proper regulation for Bitcoin in the UK, I mean, hopefully it's not a very long time. I could see it between the next 12 to 18 months, uh, depending on how it plays out. But I think it's something to take away from, from this that we are seeing the FCA here coming out and saying, right, guys, this is our stance on certain situations. It also falls into what we actually saw in Singapore, mm -hmm. where they came out and they categorized cryptos in three different categories. Yeah. All of these regulators seem to be having a very similar view. You've got the traditional exchange tokens, as you like to call it, um, Bitcoin, Litecoin. Ethereum is a funny one, depending on where it falls under. Um, there probably needs to be some sort of clarification as to where Ethereum will will fall. But they've definitely given a three different categories for each cryptocurrency. So we have something to follow. If you're an exchange token, you seem to have kind of a, a thumbs up. Mm -hmm. If you're a utility token, thumbs up. But then proving you're a utility token could could take some yeah. while. Um, but the security tokens is what they've categor categorically came out and said, right, you fall under the regulation. You fall under traditional financial regulations. Um, and in the UK, I do believe that we are going to come out with something because depending on what happens with Brexit, 
Um, mm-hmm. I believe they do want the UK to be a financial hub and we need to have some incentives, especially for a market growing so quickly um, because traditionally UK seems to be a lot of homes for cryptocurrency companies. We are attracting them here in the UK to continue that attraction, to continue the growth. We do need something which will incentivize most companies to stay here. Um, I mean, following along what we've seen in Gibraltar and Malta, where they've actually came out and had DLT licenses being put in place. I mean, uh, for Gibraltar, (coughs) they've actually put this DLT license where you can operate it as a regulated institution for custodianship and actually handling crypto assets, which is very good news. I mean, Gibraltar and the UK's relationship is quite close. So maybe the UK is looking at Gibraltar as kind of a guinea pig and saying, right, let's see what happens in this jurisdiction before we decide to to make a move. Um, Malta, you probably know quite well. Yeah. Um, they've, they've put certain positions in place to allow people to gain these regulatory statuses. And we've seen Binance, you know, already trying to establish a headquarters in Malta. We have seen various other institutions move into Malta in the crypto space. So I believe it's a matter of time before the big in the big jurisdictions, the UK, the US um, and Europe come out and actually have a stance. I mean, China is one that we, probably need, area. Yeah, we yeah. probably need to watch. I mean, they haven't banned Bitcoin, but they've banned Bitcoin exchanges. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think the next year or so regulation is going to play a great part in, yeah. in the crypto i think it's space. also important to address that it's not just the regulators that safeguard the whole ecosystem like we've had one of the co-founders of ethereum come out and say that with icos he believes that the purchasers of these tokens at ico level should have a buyback clause which exactly means, that, yeah which means they can pretty much pull their funds at any point should they deem the project leaders not to shift their weight so in essence if i invest in your project and i think you're pretty much not you're just sitting on your ass all day or misleading investors essentially exactly i can then pull my funds and get the same amount back now um again with the crypto task force i totally agree i think it's a step in the positive right direction um i also what i take away is from that is that they also think the market is very immature still so they believe that um stuff like derivatives aren't ready for the market now your options, um, your warrants, stuff like that. Because how do you assign a premium on something which is so volatile? Um, and that's a big sort of issue at the minute. Um, where actually Cyrus is actually working on something at the minute. Um, but it would be it would be exciting. I think between the next 12 and 18 months, like you said, when regulation sort of comes into effect, we have clear guidelines. We can then categorize tokens properly um, and regulate them accordingly. I think that's when these products will be available. Stuff like short selling. All of these products will lead to a truer market value, um, less volatile, greater stability, which means greater long-term growth. We're not just going to see mo- um, money leak in and out. It's going to be more stable yeah. and remain within the ecosystem. Completely, completely agree. Yeah. So, I mean, one thing I'll, I do want to touch on on the back of that mm. is an ETF. Um, the reason the ETF and we're seeing the ETF applications being denied and being denied, they're citing the same reason. What a lot of people don't realize is the same thing they're falling back on market manipulation. They are really worried about these exchanges and how these exchanges operate. Are there people, you know, market making, bot trading, zero fees, what we actually saw out in China. They're really, really worried. We saw when we was out in Singapore, I believe the, correct me if I'm wrong, hopefully we'll get Will to pop something up on the screen and just correct me. So we did see, I believe it was the New York um, prosecutor come out and do a report. And he mentioned five big exchanges on there. Mm -hmm. Um, these big exchanges, he suggested that they should be investigated for market manipulation. Once there is this this threat and this issue with market manipulation, I do think all the regulators are going to take exactly the same stance and are going to take a step back because one thing they don't want to do is regulate a market which is going to put retail investors uh, in jeopardy. And if, if these exchanges are operating unethically, Mm-hmm. Um, and manipulating certain 
But it goes hand aspects. in hand. I think it's good that, like you said, the five exchanges. What I thought was really impressive was the majority of the exchanges willingly hand over data. Yeah. And, and that is what we need. We need a collaboration between the authorities and the crypto space in order to establish clear guidelines. Unless you're holding Monero. <laughs> <laughs> and then the whole thing around we touched on earlier, so the whole security tokens that it's clear, um, crypto asset task force have set their sort of guidance around those and not exchange or utility tokens. The reason why I wouldn't say we're excited, but we're more positive about that than we are bearish is because end of the day, if you, are, if you do want this space to flourish, um, institutional money will help uh, a lot of it will help gain adoption and further adoption anyway and essentially for that to happen uh, those institutions will only be comfortable once they see that yes there there is regulation in place there is protection in place and so with that obviously comes a crypto assets task force and the clarity that they provide so if there is no clarity and you go and launch a project and then you get burned when the regulation comes out so that's why it's positive for those in the space with regulation and completely agree on your point as well what you just touched on. Um, you mentioned the futures and the derivatives. They've uh, sort of mentioned their stance on that, uh, that crypto backed derivatives, CFDs, futures, complete no go to retails, to retail investors anyway. Uh, I think they're going to come out with an announcement in before the end of this year, actually, in the next month or so, uh, where they're going to essentially prohibit the sale of uh, crypto backed derivatives. So, um, yeah, that's going to be interesting. I mean, Again, I, I don't think they should go a step too far and try strong arm the industry because one thing we have seen is we are a very, very resilient industry. I mean, we've been attacked left, right and center, you know, various regulations. You know, we've, we've saw China try and forcefully control cryptocurrencies in their jurisdiction. Um, that just led to local Bitcoins having an absolute surge out in China. I mean, they do really need to be careful because right now it is a point where a lot of people in this industry want to work with regulators. And if they turn on us and they, they, they turn on this industry and this community, it could be the birth of something which they cannot control um, and something which they did not want. Um, if we look at, you know, other traditional markets, which um, we've seen disruptive technology here over, we've seen the music industry um, with torrents and LimeWire and the downloading and that industry has been uh, through a lot and they've had to adapt and change and now we've got Spotify um, where we've got a lot, probably a lot of people here and in, in the UK and all over the world who used to torrent and used to download music now just pay for Spotify because you know what, it's convenient, it's easy, it's simple. Yeah. It's a disruptive technology, which is now taken the music industry by storm, but it's also fixed a lot of stuff that were there. I mean, I can we've seen this with Netflix, blockbusters. And I mean, I do see this happening in the crypto space. If they try to take a very strong arm approach um, to this technology, we could see a very similar effect of, of something being born off the back of it. Um, so it's going to be interesting. Only time yeah, will tell. You've got to realize as well, if they try to... Uh, prohibit and sort of suppress and constrain the industry too much you got to realize a lot of these miners and people and the developers behind this whole industry a lot of them are already millionaires or pretty much almost billionaires they've already been incentivized they've got what they need so now they're just going to go away sit down in like a in, in their room and just code away and, exactly and code around a solution, around a, a solution essentially around the regulation yeah exactly so, and that's, that's what they really don't want because right now for the first time money is a content type it can, we have a choice. We can pick what type of money we want to use for the first time in history. We're not bound by jurisdictional limits or any sort of regulation or restrictions in terms of money that we use. I could easily now use Bitcoin all over the world, just the same as every single other person. That is a really scary thought for the regulators because for the first time, they don't have control over the money supply. They do not control essentially what the people in their country can spend and can use yeah if they go against it in a very bad way i mean you could spawn off a completely different type of money that they did not want um i mean banning bitcoin you're gonna have to have a policeman in every single home i, I laugh at those two it's, words banning yeah, bitcoin it's it's, it's going to be something they really don't want to do so i do think a favorable regulation is going to be right now favorable for both parties the regulators as well as the community and the industry yeah 
And like you said, if it's not favorable, we've seen it with China, you just pick up and start shop elsewhere. Exactly. So we saw volume go from China to Malaysia to Singapore. There really is no way to stop it. Yeah. But on that, we've been on regulation for quite some time. Um, <laughs> Hot topic. Yeah. I, I need um, a few coffees to wake me up from regulation talk. Um, <laughs> but yeah, mate, I know we, we, we've touched on a few topics. Uh, we're going to have you on a lot more as well as we slowly do start. Looking to ra- forward to it. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, no, it's been a pleasure having you on. As we do start to wrap up, just want to uh, sort of ask you why people should be calling up Ilya Yusuf for OTC services. Uh, what advantages uh, we have on our OTC desk? And how can people find you, essentially? I mean, quick plug. So what what we really want to do with our OTC desk is we want to make it very simple and very easy for institutions, um, high net worth, so credit investors, anyone who wants access to the market to be able to get involved. Um, We're going to be launching a new platform for the OTC desk very soon, which will make your lives a lot easier. Um, One thing I do think that we have an advantage um, over a few other people in this space is the fact that we are crypto guys. Um, we live and breathe crypto. So we're part of the industry, we're part of the community, and we're going to prove that with the services that we provide and the OTC desk is no, no, no excuse there. Yeah, no, thanks thanks very much, mate. Um, and obviously people can find you at... Yeah, I've, so you I've can find me on my, I believe my LinkedIn, you can contact me on. Um, we're going to on plug Instagram. it up. Yeah, yeah. we're going to get Will plug up all the stuff will just uh, behind the camera we're looking at will yeah yeah so Cre- he's, he's, creative he's, genius behind this whole production uh so it wouldn't be possible without him he's going to plug everything up appreciate it and it's been a pleasure having you on having yeah. you on mate we'll, been a great we'll chat guys and i hope we again. do it soon cheers yeah. cheers so yeah so just before uh we do sort of uh finalize uh we just had Ilya on and we've just come out with the vlogs recently Ilya spoke just now about our passion for the industry and actually we live and breathe this space I think for some of you you've been asking for a bit more content and we're actually we're only just getting started guys you have not seen anything yet uh, we've we've got the vlogs more importantly we've got the crypto time which is a segment of the podcast hosted by portfolio managers Antonio Schillingford and James Coughlin from our advisory desk uh, so send any questions you have in the comments and they'll be answering those in their segment of the show as well uh, but otherwise it's been a pleasure guys um we're going to be having a external guest a special guest coming onto the podcast later this week and uh we'll we won't really announce who that is yet but special guest lined up from outside of the company uh and we'll be publishing that one uh, in due course as well but thanks for listening guys uh please hit the subscribe and the bell notification and we'll catch you on the next one peace cheers guys Bye.